everyone. Uh, just for anyone that's just joined us, just letting you know that we are recording this session. Uh, so it will be available for everyone uh, following the session and will go up onto uh, WorkSafe's uh, web page that you are able to access, access it uh, after today and share it with anyone else uh, within your industry that could benefit from, from the information. So we'll uh, get moving uh, or keep moving uh, as we are already on four o'clock. So good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Keeping Safe in Horticulture this Harvest Season uh, information session. Uh, this is the fourth uh, information session uh, in this series so far. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which we're all meeting today and pay my respects to elders past and present. As a quick introduction, uh, my name is Kate Lewis uh, and I am in a part of the agriculture team at WorkSafe Victoria and I'll be hosting this afternoon's webinar. Uh, we know that harvest uh, is in full swing for a lot of you uh, and also one of the, very, uh, the busiest times of the year and, and can be made more challenging, of course, by uh, ongoing changes uh, with the COVID pandemic as well. So we've brought together a, a range of speakers uh, from uh, different organisations to help, uh, I guess, get everyone up to speed with the latest health and safety information and requirements for horticulture producers in Victoria. So we're joined today from, with, from, uh, with, by speakers from WorkSafe Victoria, Agriculture Victoria, Labour Hire Authority, Victorian Farmers Federation and the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions. And they're all going to be providing information to help your business stay safe and operational this harvest season and of course uh, assist you in uh, navigating the latest health and safety requirements and of course uh, we do have time for questions uh, and answers as well throughout the day. So just before I pass over to the first uh, speaker for today just a couple of tech reminders uh, for anyone that isn't as familiar with Microsoft Teams, which is the online platform we're using today. There's a couple of functions just up in your top right corner. Uh, there is a little microphone icon. Uh, this one turns your microphone on and off. If it does have a cross through it, it means it's off. We do recommend uh, turning it off throughout the session if you aren't speaking, just to, uh, just to mitigate any background noise for, for anyone speaking. We do also have the video icon up there as well. That one does turn your video on and off. Uh, you are welcome to have your video on, but as mentioned, we are recording this session. And if you are having any challenges with any connectivity issues, we do recommend making sure your video is off. Uh, the final function just to talk to you quickly is there's a speech bubble up in that top bar as well. Uh, that one is the chat function. If you click on that one, it'll open up a little chat box uh, to the right. You are welcome to type any questions into that uh, box throughout the session and our speakers can answer those as well. You are of course welcome to ask any questions to our speakers after after their presentations as well uh, or if any come to mind throughout the session we can you can save those up and we can get to those at the end too. So without any further ado I'll pass across to our first speaker and that is Claire Harper from the Department of Just uh, jo Justice and Community State, oh, sorry, from one Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions, uh, who will be talking to us about COVID safe requirements. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much, Kate. Can everybody uh, see my slides? Yeah, OK, um, so thank you. My name's Claire Harper um, and I work in the Industry Coordination Recovery Group within the Department of Jobs precincts and regions and I'm here to talk to you today about the latest updates from a COVID safe point of view. We'll touch on vaccination requirements, what happens when you have a case in the workplace, other business requirements and exemptions as well for your industry, COVID safe plans and then what supports available to you and what resources. I will be referring to several uh, web links and I'll be putting all these web links in the chat after I have spoken. So vaccination requirements, just a reminder, as you all know, all workers must be fully vaccinated um, or have a valid me medical exemption uh, to work. This can include contractors, volunteers and students on placement. Employers must collect, record and hold vaccination information yes. for all workers. Doesn't have to be uh, retained once it's been cited. However, if you hire seasonal workers through a labour 
hire provider, then it's not the responsibility of the employer to keep that information. It's a responsibility to confirm that vaccination status of the workers with the labour provider. It's their responsibility. Um, there's been some an update recently around the third dose requirement, and I do want to clarify, and there is a, an FAQ on the website for uh, agriculture and horticulture to confirm that a farm business or a farm that's got packing facilities as part of their operations is not considered a food distribution premises. Food distribution premises is listed as one where uh, any worker would re be required to have a third dose. So that's the kind of premises where the primary purpose of um, is a distribution of food. But a farm selling its produce or a sale yard or a market or an on-farm packing shed is excluded from the scope of the mandatory third dose requirement, but an off farm packing or processing plant is included. So do read that carefully and make sure you understand that. And just to really highlight, we have had recent um, reports, uh, unfortunately, of some outbreaks um, amongst seasonal workers in uh, the orchards, for example. Um, and I know that some of the workers will live in shared accommodation and it, we believe that they're under vaccinated. So absolutely essential um, that workers are fully vaccinated and we want to really, really stop um, this spread and any any more outbreaks. A case in the workplace. So a worker who has tested positive for COVID-19 and worked indoors during their infectious period must inform their workplace as soon as possible. So the infectious period is 48 hours before the person started to develop symptoms or if they're asymptomatic, 48 hours before their positive test. So the workplace then has to take reasonable steps to identify and inform other workers who may have been exposed to a case. There's some guidance here about face-to-face -face is less than one and a half meters for more than 15 minutes in a day with that case. Or if it's in a small indoor space, it's under 100 square meters, then it's for more than two hours in contact um, with, that, with, with, a, with the confirmed case. There is a very useful online self-assessment tool to determine who are workplace contacts in your workplace. And I'll put that link in the chat. And also, if there are five or more cases within a seven day period, that is considered an outbreak. And uh, you must then notify the Department of Health about that. So workers who are close contacts, that means they uh, live together or uh, classify as a household-like contact. Um, in some sectors, they are exempt from the mandatory quarantine of, of seven days like everybody else. And it does apply to your industry that that quarantine is not required. So there are certain conditions around that, but in the food industry, agriculture, forestry, manufacturing, all these industries here, um, workers in those industries um, directly providing food production, processing, warehousing, distribution may be exempt from quarantine as long as these conditions are met. So that's if they're a household contact of a confirmed case. So what are those conditions? Well, the exemption only applies to those people attending work, not going anywhere else in the community. If at any point that contact, that close contact develops symptoms or tests positive, then of course that exemption no longer applies and they need to isolate. And so if it's essential and it's necessary for continuity, continuity of operations that you need that worker and all other operations have been um, exhausted, then um, they, can, uh, they can go back to work as long as, of course, that they've told their employer that they're a close contact, there's consent from both the employer and the worker, and of course the worker is already double vaccinated. So again, the, con the conditions around this exemption that will allow them to, to come back to work, every day they need to do a rapid antigen test and return a negative result prior to attending work. They must wear a face mask at all times. Um, they cannot enter shared break areas. So we try and organize a solo sort of break time. The minute if they do test positive, they are then a case. And of course, they must isolate. They must as much as possible travel directly to and from work and not go elsewhere en route and not share, try and avoid public transport or carpooling. So it really is just to allow them to work and, and nothing else. 
Some other general requirements for businesses. So, of course, we want you to keep business records, including information about when workers and other people were on site. There is, of course, the QR code service, which is strongly recommended, but not required for farms. We want all businesses, as you see, to maximize ventilation. Um, it's great at this time of year for that. Um, keep spaces and equipment clean um, and just reduce or eliminate sort of recirculated air. And of course, we want businesses to respond quickly to a confirmed or suspected case to limit any further exposure. We know there are lots of workers for whom English isn't their first language, and sometimes it can be hard to, to potentially communicate all the rules um, in English to someone who may not um, have very strong language of English. So there are a lot of different translated materials and information um, on the culturally and linguistically diverse page, the translated information pages of the coronavirus website in lots of languages. So that link I will share and you can share it with employees well. So every business must have a COVID safe plan. There's a new template available. I'll put the link in the chat. Don't think of it as a template like I must follow this. Think of it as a guide. The main thing about COVID safe plan, and I'm sure everyone's got one, is they have to be kept up to date. So the main thing is, is look at this guide and just check that, yep, you've, you've gone through all of these steps. So, you know, what actions will you take to prevent the introduction of COVID-19 in your workplace? What kind of face mask or PPE equipment do you need? How will you prepare and respond to a case? And how will you meet the government requirements? Organisations with multiple sites must have a COVID safe plan for each work site. And very importantly, there must be copies kept at each premises. So if anyone was to come and visit, then staff know where that, that copy um, is. So what's it? It's a list of health and safety actions. As I said, it is a requirement, but we don't force you to do it in a particular way. Uh, as long as it's written down, um, it, is, it can be designed to meet your needs. And also, um, we do have a lot of support around helping you create that plan, which I'll talk about in a minute. But there's a website there where you can see the latest guide slash template. So other support and resources, um, the government has extended rent relief for small and family businesses experiencing financial hardship due to this latest wave. So more information is available on the Victorian Small Business Commission website. As I said, there's a new COVID safe plan template um, and it is mandatory for everyone to have a COVID safe plan. And we are offering forums that are free, available to anyone to come and listen to, um, to our team talk about how to ensure that your COVID safe plan is up to date. And after going to that forum, if you want any further assistance, we can offer smaller workshops, we can also do it in a, another language. We have a cold team that speak many different languages. So we would encourage you, if you have any questions about COVID safe plans, to attend one of the forums first, and then if you needed further help, to get in touch with us. And as I said, uh, there is um, a contact management tool that's online to help you try and determine who are close contacts, uh, what do they need to do, what do I do when there's a case in the workplace. So that is all kept on our web pages. And then so finally, here are some re uh, web pages that I'd highly recommend. I'll put them in the link. But again, there's a, there's a really the COVID safe workplaces has been updated this week and it's really clear, really goes through those those principles that will, will never change really in terms of um, the sort of uh, best best practice around um, COVID, COVID safety. But also web pages here about vaccination requirements. As I said, the contact uh, checklist what to do when there's a case in the workplace, uh, specific guidance and FAQs for your industry, your sector, and then information in other languages as well. So I'll put those links in the chat, but please let me know um, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. I'll uh, open it up for any questions from anyone uh, online today, either pop them in the chat or you can ask them directly to Claire. I think that's an, a no for now. If you do have anything come to mind, please do feel free to pop them in the chat or ask them at the end of the session. Claire will pop some links into the, the chat as well. So you, are, you can easily find some of those resources that Claire was talking to uh, just before. 
So I'll pass on to our next speaker, uh, who is Nick Tischler. He is an inspector uh, with WorkSafe Victoria, and he'll be talking to us about how to keep, or I guess, WorkSafe priorities and how to keep workers uh, safe in horticultural workplaces during harvest. Over to you, Nick. I think you're still on mute at the moment, unfortunately. I'll get off mute first. <laughs> <laughs> Share my screen. Give me a tick. All right, can everyone see my screen there? Yeah, all right. we can. Lovely. So I suppose thanks everyone, first of all, for taking the time to come and listen to our uh, various topics that we're here to talk to. Um, as Kate said, my name's Nick Tischler. I'm the Senior Inspector in the Geelong team. One of the predominant areas that I do inspections in is agriculture. Of course, horticulture is part of um, of that subsector. So I thought today I'd just talk to uh, what the typical things that we see in horticulture and agriculture and what some places are doing to control those risks. So I suppose in general terms, you can see on the screen there, there are a lot of the um, hazards that we come across. So harvesting is um, always quite a busy and dynamic time in any agriculture business. There's typically a lot of farm machinery being used um, and farm machinery typically also um, has a higher risk of entrapment points and things like that. So it's around about making sure they're being um, assessed prior to harvest and looked at. We'll cover a bit on information instruction and training, what that sort of looks like and manual handling. So I suppose the first one in horticulture is traffic management, um, particularly around harvest. Ideally, what we would be looking for is looking for employers to design systems that physically um, minimise interaction between people and equipment. And the fundamentals are really no different to um, a setup like on the slide here in a paddock or in a packing yard in like back on the uh, farm. Uh, what the controls physically look like might look a little bit different. Obviously in the, the photo there, we wouldn't be asking for a a physical barrier because it's quite dynamic, quite fluid. But in your, your packing areas where you've got a higher frequency and more consistent frequency of plant and pedestrians, then that might be um, something that uh, could be considered. And the other one down there is there's been some really exciting developments in terms of um, pedestrian se sensing software so there is now software out there that can detect things like high visibility clothing and alert the drivers of power mobile plant uh, of that pedestrian in the area. Some of the systems will even stop the equipment if you get too close to it. Uh, and the benefit of this sort of software is you can use other equipment that has reflective type material like traffic management bollards to set up um, exclusion zones very quickly and quite affordably and I, I think the uh, the cost of these sort of solutions is just getting cheaper and cheaper as technology progresses um, and I think particularly in agriculture it's an exciting area where um, this sort of technology can be used. Uh, guarding from equipment so you can see there there's a couple of power takeoff shafts one is um, what I would consider the guarding is no good and the other one is okay. Um, things like this are typical that we would see in a farm and it's really critical that, um, you know, you're assessing your equipment before you're actually using it in harvest and you're doing your preparation at the front end um, because we know that when you're in the middle of harvest, to go out and find a um, a power takeoff shaft guard is quite difficult when you've got a limited win window to get um, 
crop off uh, or product off the trees and into the uh, the packing yard. The other one down there is the quad bikes. So making sure that if you are operating a quad bike and there's a risk of rollover, number one, the quad bike is fitted with a operator protective device um, and that whoever is wearing is riding that bike is wearing an appropriate helmet. Um, and also that they've been deemed as competent to ride and operate that piece of equipment. Um, it's probably not surprising to too many people in the room that quad bikes and tractors do make up the majority of fatalities in Victorian agricultural workplaces every year. So it is an area that will continue to be a focus of WorkSafe going into the future. Training for staff. I apologise I couldn't find a nice training photo, but um, you know, the things that we're looking at are making sure that staff are provided with sufficient training to do their job safely and that that training is provided in a mean, in a way that they can understand. Um, so a, a classic example is if you went to a fast food outlet that um, hires predominantly 15 year old kids, you will find that the, the training that that fast food outlet provides will be um, predominantly uh, like comic type based, um, cartoon based training. And that's because we know that that's what that age group demographic are very good at comprehending. The other one is around the culturally and linguistically diverse workers. It's already been mentioned this morning but or this afternoon, but we do know that um, that group of workers are at a higher risk um, of injury because perhaps they don't have a proper understanding of um, what the training that's being provided is. I mean, you can have the best training in the world, but if that training is provided in English and no one within your workplace provide or speaks English, then that's obviously um, problematic. And the other thing is, making sure that your your staff are, are empowered to talk about safety you know so if they see something that's not right do they have the confidence to have that conversation whether it's with a supervisor the manager of the farm or maybe a health and safety representative but that is really work safe find in every industry that is the the critical link to making sure workplaces are safe Manual handling, most people see the box down the bottom and that's what they think of manual handling, but manual handling is everywhere. It's, it's uh, particularly common in agriculture um, and there's a number of reasons why that might be the case, but the fu fundamentals are the same. You know, Do, do we have a, an appropriate tool for the job? Is the tool that we're using reducing that manual handling risk? Um, is it maintained in a safe way? When there is a manual handling injury in a workplace, making sure that you're doing a, a good investigation into that incident. And of course, making sure that, um, that that investigation into that incident really stays systematic. So one thing I know as an inspector is if I turn up to a workplace anywhere in Victoria and there's a manual handling injury and there's an investigation that says that this happened because a person made a poor choice. I know straight away that um, other options are not being looked at like is the equipment that that person was using appropriate for the job? Was it stored in a means where that person could access it easily? And of course, the bottom one there is be open to new ideas. It's um, for agriculture is very good at um, adapting to new ways when it comes to uh, making production increases, and manual handling is no different to that. So, lastly, 
WorkSafe do have a occupational health and safety essentials program. So as part of this program, small businesses can have a consultant attend their workplace and help them with health and safety issues. And WorkSafe will foot the bill for the first three consultations. And this, the other important thing to note is that this program is completely independent of anything that any inspector does. So it's, um, it's a means where WorkSafe can support small and medium businesses because we, we do understand that owners and operators of small medium businesses do wear a number of hats and occupational health and safety is just one of those hats. And if we can support workplaces to be safer, then that's a very important role that uh, we can do. So you can do that via um, jumping on our website through the OHS Essentials program there and uh, have a chat to them. It is obligation free. You can have that chat. They're not taking notes or anything like that. So, and it's, I do know of a number of um, agriculture based businesses that have gone through it and have got some real benefit out of it. And that's me. Is there anyone got any questions? Yeah, hi Nick. Uh, hi Nick. Can you hear me? Yep. My name's Andy. I'm calling, uh, from Hascon. I do a lot of uh, site audits on some farms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm noticing the lack of knowledge of storage of agricultural chemicals. Uh, it's a big issue as well. I noticed you didn't raise that in the forum. We're finding that there's inadequate training, a lot of them, in the uh, storage of their pesticides, herbicides, and their farms as well. How are you finding that? Yeah, it's it, look. I, I would suggest that there there is a piece of work that WorkSafe should be and are doing consistently on handling of chemicals. I, I know there are a number of fairly high profile court cases that have gone on recently regarding some of these chemicals, and I think you are right. I, and I think it. It is something that we are always talking about, and it's often really coming down to the basics. So do workplaces have the safety data sheets? Do they know how to read and interpret the information off those safety data sheets? Because obviously that's where you do get all the information around whether a certain chemical can be stored with another chemical. Agree. Thank you. Thanks for your question there, Andy. Uh, was there any other questions for Nick at the moment? Um, I've got one. Um, hi, Nick. My name's David. Um, just in regards to the TMP, so are you happy, if, if hypothetically, if you were to come out to the winery and you've seen a mud map of the vineyards uh, of which way tractors should run in and out, according to people having stuff like that. Is that something that you're, you're happy with, or do you want to see something more in depth? Um, no, I, I'm happy with. I guess what we are always assessing as a, as inspectors is, I suppose, what's reasonably practicable, and, and that really depends on um, the workplace and the conditions that you have on that workplace. Um, I would imagine for a like for a, a winery where you're out amongst the vines, that mud map is probably okay. And that's probably um, you know the other piece that we'd be looking for is making sure that the employees know and understand a bit about that um, that process. Uh, where we might look for something more substantial might be where you've got a lot of forklift movement, um, you know, and where you've got your tanks and things like that, you know, because then it it does become a bit more reasonably practicable to put in a like a, a physical barrier and walkways and things like that. But certainly I wouldn't be looking for yellow fencing and marked out walkways in the middle of vines. 
Yeah, we'll see. At the moment, all of our stuff goes off site and gets squashed and treated off site. So it's more just the picking side of things that I'm sort yeah. of more yeah. interested in. So, yeah, that's, that's all right. That's good. Hmm. Thanks, David. John, did you have something to add there? Only to uh, add to uh, what Nick was saying, and um, we had OH, the OHS Essentials Program, all the work we do. Um, the inspectors, like Nick, uh, that visit workplaces, they don't have the time nor resource to actually do full-blown safety orders or to talk to farmers about all of the issues that might be encompassed in all the various chapters of the regulations. When they go visit farms, and even to the Nick's presentation, he just highlighted a couple of areas, but they do look at chemical safety. They do look at uh, forklift and all the other areas that are covered under the regs. Um, but if it's forklift safety, to one point that Nick really emphasised was the importance of consultation with your employees. So I only to add to that question about the traffic management plans. Make sure if you've got one, that you've actually developed in consultation with your employees. Those that actually do the work. So you've got your forklift operators together and the people in the uh, in the packing shed, which is where the forklifts, where we see them in particular, where we say, yeah, get those workers together and sit down and talk with them about how you are going to make sure your forklift operates safely in that environment. So I just wanted to add to Nick's, uh, Nick's, question, uh, Nick's answer. Thank you, John. I might wrap it up there just in, for the sake of time, but if you do have any other questions uh, for Nick or for the, work, the WorkSafe team, you can pop them in the chat uh, and we'll try to come back to them at the end or make sure they're answered after the session uh, and we can send out those answers and FAQs as well. So thank you so much, Nick, and for joining us uh, from the car as well whilst you're out finishing your work day too. No worries, out visiting farms. <laughs> <laughs> Still on your way home. So that's it. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, we'll now pass across to our next uh, speaker, and that is Tom Cunningham from the Labor Hire Licensing Authority. So Tom will be speaking to us about licensed labor hire and labor hire workers. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Kate. Um, hopefully my uh, slides have just come up. Um, so my name's Tom Cunningham. I'm a senior compliance officer with the um, Labour Hire Authority. Um, um, so look, we're also keen to see um, that everyone has an up-to-date uh, COVID safe plan. Um, and we're also keen to see that everyone's using licensed Labour Hire. Um, just in very simple terms, what is Labour Hire? Labour Hire is when you get another business in to provide workers for you. So typically in horticulture, um, that's, named, that's known as a contractor, and they'll bring in those additional workers you'll need to get um, a crop picked um, or maybe some pruning or whatever it might be. Um, if you're not providing the labour yourself and you're not paying the, the workers directly, um, it I'm 99% sure that you're using labour hire. Um, if, if you're using labour hire, you need to make sure that the labour hire that you're getting um, is, is licensed. Um, so that's probably one of the key things um, that we're doing. Um, the other thing we're checking that the labour hire providers are looking after their, their workers um, are making sure they've been treated properly. Um, so more to that point, um, is, your is your provider uh, licensed? Um, Look, to get a license with us, um, the provider simply needs to apply um, and what they'll need to do um, is pay a fee, um, but they'll also need to show that they're compliant with existing legislation. So things we're looking at is, do they have um, a work cover uh, certificate? Um, are they um, paying people the correct wages? Are they paying super? Um, if they're providing accommodation, is that accommodation up to scratch? So as long as they're doing all those things, um, there should be no reason why they wouldn't be given um, a, a labour hire licence. Um, the person requesting the labour hire, uh, the, the labour hire licence needs to show that they're fit and proper. So in some circumstances, they might get a police check uh, run on them just to make sure that, um, you know, they're, they're fit to be holding a licence. Um, the easiest way to check um, if someone's got a licence is just to go to our website um, and this is our website here. Um, it's just labourhireauthority.gov.vic.gov.au. Um, if you click on here, it'll take you to um, where to find um, a licensed labour hire provider. You can put their name in. Um, you can also put um, their ABN number in um, and, and go from there. If, if you're perhaps looking for someone um, to provide your labour, you might look for that. Just put a postcode in or put an industry in. Um, and then they'll bring them up and show all the ones that are in the industry. Um, 
we can do if they turn up, you just have a click on their license number and it'll say, look, you know, their license in force has got a green tick and they're good to go. There's no dramas with their license. Um, and, and that's that's great. Um, what, what you can also do um, is just going back to our front page here is, is follow um, a, a labour hire, follow a provider. Um, and what this does is if you just click on that, you can sign up. Um, if there's any problems with the labour hire provider moving forward, say for example, look, there might be an issue with um, their fees or something like that, and they and they become unlicensed, we'll we'll let you know if there's any change to the licence. Um, so that's an easy way to do that. Um, I'm just going to talk um, a little bit now about the horticultural award. Um, so when you're negotiating with um, your labour hire provider as to how much they they need to get paid for this season. Um, you just need to consider, look, the wages went up on the 1st of July um, last year. So the uh, the full-time rate for a, a level one is $20.33. Um, add the casual loading to that, um, and that brings it up to $25.41. So that's what the worker should be getting paid. However, when you're negotiating a price, um, you need to consider, look, there's a superannuation needs to be paid, work cover needs to be paid. Um, and possibly payroll tax as well. Um, so look, you, you're probably looking at least the, the, the $29 mark um, to, to make sure people are paid correctly. Um, and also look, I would expect that would increase as well because the labour hire provider might have other expenses. Um, and also look, they need to make some sort of profit to, um, to make it worth their while. Um, we always suggest that you check in with the Fair Work Ombudsman and you can sign up to them um, at fairwork.gov.au. Um, and sign up as a business um, and you, you can select an industry when there's changes to the award that covers your industry. So the horticulture award, for example, they'll, they'll get in contact with you and say, look, the wages have gone up. You need to make some changes, but it's an easy way uh, to, um, to stay in touch with what's going on. Um, if the workers um, are getting paid piece rates, um, they should have a signed piecework agreement. Um, if you're paying piecework, um, if you're paying piecework, the guy should be making at least $28.46 per hour. Um, that's based on, on average competent uh, picker. Um, now, there has been some changes announced to the horticultural award um, regarding piecework. Um, they were announced at the beginning of this month. Um, they're effective at the end of April um, this year. So um, my, my advice is to go to the Fair Work Ombudsman website. Um, and at the moment, they're just saying that look there has been some changes and they're going to be updating the web page um, with 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 a bit more information about it um, so look i would yeah, suggest to definitely go and have a look at the fair work on some website and find out what that's all about and see how that's going to affect your business um, and again look i think closer to the time it's likelihood that there'll probably be some some webinars going out at some stage about that um, that, that, that we should probably organise. Um, but I would say again, look, sign up to the Fair Commons website um, and, and just get that information. Um, very good. Okay. Uh, look, if something's not right um, and, th and there's a problem, um, we, we'd like to know about it. And, and things that we, we'd like to hear about is, say, for example, you've, you've got some workers and everything's working out well, and all of a sudden they turn around and say, look, we're going to go and work at this other place. They're going to pay us cash in hand. Um, we think it's a better deal for us, so we'll see you later. Um, you know, that's the, that's the kind of thing that we'd like to know about. If someone's not doing the right thing, or they're going to operate through a labour hire provider that's not, that's not licensed, we'd like we'd like to know about it. If if they're not licensed, it's probably the, the best indicator that the workers are not going to be treated properly. Um, they might be getting paid cash in hand, but they're missing out on super. Um, and if something goes wrong, there's no insurance um, to look after them. Um, and again, look, if we go back to um, our web page, um, you can sort of report a problem with us um, and just put some details about the business um, that where there's an issue um, and tell us what the problem's all about. If there's some evidence, um, look, maybe you've got a pay slip or, or something like that that's showing that they're not being looked after properly. We'd like to know about that. And then you can give your details there. Um, the more information we have, um, and if it's possible, um, give us your, your name and contact details and we'll be able to get um, in contact with you again. Um, 
but apart from that, look, that's all I really wanted to talk about today. I think it's, yeah, just, just to keep it brief from us. Um, but if there's any questions, I'm very happy to take those now. Thank you so much, Tom. Is there any questions uh, for Tom on labour hire? I think that's a no for now, but if do it, if any do come to mind, please feel free to pop them in the chat or save them up uh, to ask at the end of the session. And we will just pop the Labour Hire uh, website links into the chat as well, so you can access those uh, throughout the session too. I'll now Thanks, pass across to our next speaker. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and we have John Darcy joining us from the Victorian Farmers Federation, who will be speaking to us about the Making Our Farms Safer, uh, Safer pro program. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kate. And a quick uh, segue between the two issues, the presentation from Nick and also Tom, just a heads up for Hort farmers in particular. Um, the IHS Act doesn't change all that often, and but it is does get the occasional amendment. And amendments which were made last year uh, actually create new duties from the 22nd of March this year, which have relates specifically to labour hire uh, employers and host employers. As far as OHS is concerned, from that date, both parties will have the same direct OHS responsibilities for all aspects where there are duties that apply the Act. And a new duty has been created that requires host employers and labour hire companies to consult, cooperate and coordinate with each other to ensure health and safety outcomes. And so if you do have a labour hire provider or uh, labour hire providers, as I see some farmers have, my advice would be to take note of that now, not wait until the 22nd of March, and probably start engaging with your labour hire providers to make sure you've got some uh, good standards in place from a safety point of view. And things that I'll be talking about is making sure you've got robust induction processes, uh, making sure you've got processes in place for uh, consultation and uh, making sure you've got processes in place for supervision. And um, labour hire provider might want to do occasional inspections of your farm to look at, at, at the farm from the point of view of uh, making sure that the workplace is safe. So these are the sort of things that labour hire companies and uh, uh, farmers are going to need to start talking to each other about. So that's just a heads up ahead of the 22nd of March. So the Making Our Farm Safer project. So we are fund VFF is funded by the um, Department of Agriculture under the Safer Smarter Farms program. And um, we're funded through to July 2023. And uh, our services are available to all Victorian farmers, irrespective of whether they're VFF members or not, free of charge. And my colleague Richard and I spend three to four days a week on farms all over Victoria. And amazingly, uh, I, from a Hort point of view, well, I've just spent uh, today on two Hort, far Hort farms up near Swan Hill. Uh, so, uh, and tomorrow I'm traveling to Murrayville out in the uh, South Australian Victorian border. Now, um, apart from farm visits and sitting down at the dining table and uh, talking with mum and dad, small visitors in particular, and uh, guiding them through the breadth of territory around what they need to know, we do provide a lot of uh, uh, policy procedure templates and checklists and a whole lot of resources. And we also do a safety walk around the farm as well. And it's uh, right at Nick's presentation, we are looking at the things that a work safety inspector might look at. Apart from uh, that work, we also have the monthly Making Our Farm Safer newsletter, and um, that's getting uh, very good readership, and it comes out uh, the third Thursday every month, so it'll be due out tomorrow, the next edition. And you'll find that on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn. Just look up Making Our Farm Safer on those po on those in those places, and that's where you'll find the newsletter. And last week we launched the um, Making Our Farm Safer website. And that's where the newsletter is kept. Uh, there's a ton of resources on there. And um, we're trying to do as much as we can humanly possibly do to try and improve the safety outcomes of the industry and to assist, uh, but also to influence the safety culture of the industry as well. And um, I strongly encourage you, if you haven't seen the newsletter, download some of the uh, previous, re um, previous editions as well and have a read of them because we do a lot of education and awareness raising through that. So uh, please uh, direct yourself there. We'd love to come and meet with you at your farm or home and uh, come and sit down at the dining table. Uh, the OHS Essentials Program as well from WorkSafe, the uh, free three hour visits from a range of consultants, it's an excellent service as well. So you're spoiled for choice, you've got us. We just do farming day in, day out. And obviously being VFF, that's our uh, bread and butter. Uh, and we're passionate about what we do. 
but we'd love to come and see you on your farm. Thanks, Kate. Thank you so much, John. I'm just going to. Oh, God, I'm uh, This should be the Making Our Farms uh, Safer website, just going into the chat there now for everyone to access as well. And I believe it was uh, Andy who asked about chemical uh, storage or hand and handling as well. And I know VFF have, have a new resource on their website around that topic too. So it might be a good one to go and check out uh, in terms of the farms that you're heading to as well uh, in that space. Was there any questions for John at the moment from everyone online? Yeah, John, it's Andy again from Hascon. I'll give you a heads up. We have had uh, been contacted by a lot of uh, labour hire uh, third parties. Exactly what you said. They're now looking at uh, what putting together some safe inspections. What they're going to do when they're sending out labour hire because they're now under, as you would be aware, chain you know chain of custody, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. They are getting onto it already, so I'd just like to articulate that to you as well. We've already received several calls from labour hire companies looking at uh, assistance in that area. We, uh, with uh, VFF, um, with we'll probably run a webinar on that uh, on those new laws to uh, provide some clarity for farmers and labour hire providers around what they need to do. Probably in about the uh, second week of uh, March, so uh, probably about. Um, close to this time, if not around about the middle of the first week. So as uh, the people got a little bit of lead time to prepare. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, John. Uh, I'll now pass across to our last speaker, but if any other questions do come to mind, just pop them in the chat and we'll try to get to those at the end. So we have Amy, Amy McCutcheon joining us from Agriculture Victoria as our last speaker for this afternoon. Amy will be talking to us about seasonal workforce support. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Kate. Um, hi, everyone. I'm the statewide seasonal workforce coordinator with Agriculture Victoria. And Agriculture Victoria is interested in ensuring that horticultural businesses and industry are aware of of what and who the authorities are and what they're looking for and how they can best support you uh, to have a safe harvest. So very interested in understanding um, industry and business uh, concerns and, and issues. But more importantly, you've uh, attended this webinar to put a face to the name, the face behind Workface, work safe, the face behind um, labour hire authorities. So if you've got a particular concern or a, a issue that you'd like to address, you can reach out to the people um, that have presented in the webinar. Um, so on to what I want to talk about, which is uh, support for seasonal workforce. So um, Agriculture Victoria has a seasonal workforce program. And if anything out of my talk, I would like you to understand and um, reach out if necessary to the seasonal workforce coordinators. These are officers for Agriculture Victoria that are based in uh, the three primary regions for horticulture. So we've got a coordinator in Greater Sunraysia, one in Goulburn Murray, one in Gippsland, Yarra Valley, and I'm the statewide coordinator. I'll put in a contact detail um, at when I finish my talk. So these statewide coordinate, oh, these workforce coordinators are um, there to support and connect farmers, industry groups, employers, labour hire and local government and agencies to work together and understand uh, what the workforce issues are and help find some local solutions to the workforce shortages. Um, and we've utilised the partnership that we've uh, established over the last 12 months to try and establish some regional uh, groups to focus on workforce issues. Uh, the workforce coordinators also support and assist businesses and industry to manage COVID safety uh, and they've supported uh, DJPR um, with the help of vaccinations, mental health, uh, wellbeing and safe work practices. Um, the program has engaged more than 2,000 stakeholders um, to date and we've directly contacted and engaged with 900 businesses. Um, over the last 18 months that we've been uh, focused in this area. Um, 
Continuing on with the program, uh, you'll see some an extension of uh, pastoral support to workers. This is building off the highly successful parcel care program and COVID safety program delivered by the Sunraysia Mali Ethnic Community Council or SMEC as the acronym. Uh, they've been very successful in delivering translated information on COVID safety to Cal communities and help address that vaccine hesitancy hesitancy and get seasonal workers vaccinated and provide them with pastoral support. So there'll be funding provided, uh, watch this space for other organisations in the other areas um, to ensure workers in those regions have access to similar support. Uh, we've invested 3.1 million in 13 projects for the seasonal workforce accommodation program. Uh, this harvest, we're seeing the benefit of this investment uh, and it has been in new accommodation, transport and support options uh, for more than 2,000 workers. The projects under the SWAP program uh, range from upgrades and additions to commercial accommodation, new on-farm accommodation, transport and accommodation support for workers. Um, there has been an Ag Resilience and Recovery Program that again has been offered grants for farms to improve their infrastructure and ac accommodation and business upgrades in the light of COVID. Uh, currently they're sitting with uh, Rural Finance who's competitively assessing those submissions. Um, another investment has been the Seasonal Workforce Industry Support Program. This program has invested over a million dollars to ensure that industry bodies and unions have the capability and capacity that they need to help, to help businesses and their members with uh, COVID safety, worker welfare and seasonal support. Um, some of the highlights have been uh, the Australian Table Grape Association has produced a range of induction videos uh, to help uh, potential job seekers understand the table grape industry. Ausveg has just released some uh, COVID safe protocol videos to, uh, that have been translated into other languages to help workers understand their COVID responsibilities. And Nursery and Gardens has established a framework and a process to connect job seekers into their industry. So it's great to see those projects actually um, fully functional and, and, and working this harvest. Uh, just two of the other things that are, that are on the agenda for um, AgPods Victoria is um, we're looking at a workforce training pilot program because as we know the um, shortage of seasonal workers, what about the, season, the workforce uh, career pathway into horticulture for the coming years? So this uh, workforce training pilot program will be delivered through local training providers in partnership with taste and industry groups and um, they will work at looking at uh, production horticulture and how training programs can be undertaken why um, the students are working in horticulture. So look, look out for some more communication on that. And also um, helping get some data on strategic workforce. So we all are aware of the harvest trail that exists in the um, Australia's east coast during harvest. Uh, what has come to light over the last couple of harvests is if we don't have good data on what that movement actually looks like. So um, the states will be, and industry sectors will be working together to try and get some data on that, um, on that movement. Uh, finally, uh, just they're not under Agriculture Victoria, but very uh, important for businesses who are looking at uh, seeking seasonal workers. Uh, Jobs Victoria has an online hub, which is a free service that it that can match businesses to job seekers. So I encourage you to check out, if you are still short on workers, I encourage you checking out the Jobs Victoria online hub or giving them a call um, on their hotline, which I'll post in the chat. And additionally, they have coordinators and mentors across the state who are working to connect job seekers into meaningful employment. The Pacific Worker Program is another um, 
scheme that um, I'm sure we're all across. Uh, that is a Commonwealth program and uh, it encourages uh, Pacific workers to come and work in uh, Victoria horticulture. Um, the scheme is going to transition to uh, the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme on the 24th of April. Um, so I'll that's another source of uh, workers. Admittedly, there's some, there's a, there's a lot of administration and uh, paperwork. You have to become an improved employer um, to access the Pacific workers. And finally, there's the Rural Financial Counselling Service. The Rural Financial and Counselling Service provides practical assistance to businesses that are experiencing or at risk of financial stress and they also provide uh, signposting to secession and industry transition and exit. So um, that's another the services businesses may like to know about. So thanks Kate, that's um, all from me. Thank you so much Amy, plenty of info on seasonal workforce support and uh, Amy will pop some links into the chat so you have access to those uh, following the session too. We'll do one uh, last call out if there's any other questions uh, for Amy or for the other speakers uh, from today. Uh, any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or ask them directly to our speakers now. While everyone's thinking about it, I will just let you know that uh, this session was recorded, so the recording will be available uh, online hopefully next week. Uh, we can let you all know, but we will also be sending out an information sheet that has links to all of the information discussed today. That'll come uh, your way into your inbox uh, and you'll also receive a, a, just a short survey link as well, just uh, so we can gain some feedback uh, on the session. And if there's anything else that you would like to hear about uh, down the track or in any other information sessions too, so please let us know in that survey. That would be really helpful. Did we have any last questions for our speakers? I think we'll take that as a no, so we'll we'll wrap up the session. I know it, uh, it's getting later in the day and everyone's got plenty to do. So thank you so much for joining us for today's information session. Uh, as mentioned, you will get all the links uh, to the information discussed. Uh, thanks again so much for joining us and we hope to see you again. Thanks everyone.